Okay, welcome to the next lecture on multiple view geometry. In the last chapter, we talked about, we started on direct methods for SLAM, uh, for uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, so for the uh, reconstruction problem of tracking the camera and estimating the geometry. And I argued that the advantages of direct methods, we have it here on the last slide, are that they uh, tend to be more robust to noise. The idea is that, um, uh, and they also tend to uh, give better reconstructions in many cases. They are often faster. And um, the idea is that uh, you avoid this intermediate step of feature extraction and feature matching that you tend to do in most more traditional or classical approaches. Both that holds both for the uh, eight-point algorithm and these kinds of linear algorithms as well as for the bundle adjustment we talked about. In the sense that even the bundle adjustment works on this abstraction of a point cloud. You extract feature points in images, and then all you work with is this geometric location of points. And you, you actually, in this step, essentially throw out all the color information and only work with that abstract level of points. And I mean, you can try that for yourself if you extract points from an images, from two images, and only work with these points and their correspondence, you're hardly going to get a meaningful reconstruction as a human. So humans tend to actually make use of this color information very heavily. And so the question is, if you give the computer just this point correspondence, a, set, a sparse set of points in their correspondence, how far do you expect the machine to get if you cannot do it? So <coughs> while although these techniques tend to work, there is uh, uh, an expectation that if we circumvent that intermediate step of feature extraction, feature matching, correspondence finding, and work directly on the images to get 3D geometry and c uh, camera motion, that we get better results, faster results, more accurate results, more robust results. And in terms of geometric reconstruction also more dense results. So rather than having just a sparse point cloud of 3D points in the end, we have uh, a dense or maybe at least semi-dense reconstruction. Someone was asking last time where what is semi-dense, where do you not get 3D information? In this particular approach, actually, you don't get 3D information in locations that have constant brightness, where the brightness or color does not change. And if you have areas like that, uh, if you think about it more, there is actually no way you can get geometry from the images. At least not from the colors, because if the color doesn't change, it's hard to to associate any notion of correspondence. And typically, that doesn't happen much in the real world, but in man-made worlds, it does happen. Like if you have white walls, for example, in man-made worlds, then the question is, how do you want to estimate their ge geometry from just color images? Um, the, the way this is often done in the dense approaches is that we'll see an example today, or some examples, they fill in information. In fact, this is, I think, the first example of dense approaches or direct approaches that I want to mention is this work of Stümer and uh, Gumholt Kremers that we published in 2010. The idea is to uh, kind of circumvent the feature extraction and directly go to dense geometry. And to this end, I mentioned it last time, what motivated us was to start with an optical flow type approach. In optical flow, we talked about it a little bit in this class. The idea is to uh, find correspondence by imposing color consistent consistency uh, for consecutive images. Here you can do the same, so you can impose color consistency. You can say the color of the first image at some pixel x should be the same as the color of, say, the eyes image. 
and so if I if you want we can draw a picture here's the geometry we see it in this image we see it in that image if this we call this pixel little x and it's in the image plane this is called the image plane we call it omega here and then we want to determine a depth map uh, on this omega so a mapping age that assigns to each pixel some depth value and really to each pixel we want a dense depth map so for any pixel on this image plane we want to know what is its depth this is h here so if this is x then this is uh, the h and in fact that point in 3d is nothing but h times x as we know if x is in homogeneous coordinates and so this is the 3d point h times x and now we can say what sh color should that point have in the other image so if i see that same point in this other image here it should have ideally the same color and how do I get that location in the other image? I have to transform this 3D point into the coordinates of image I and then just back project. Pi here is the standard projection. And then the two colors should be consistent. Of course, in practice, they will not always be exactly the same. And so what we penalize is, uh, is this discrepancy, the norm uh, of this discrepancy you could call it the residuum how different are the colors and then here the idea is you see there's an integral for those not so familiar with this notation you can just think of it as a sum over all pixels and so we are summing this discrepancy measure over all pixels and we do so for all images not just the second image but a number of images say n images in optical flow typically you only consider two consecutive images because if you keep moving a camera around then the correspondence field at every time changes it's it's the flow that changes here it's different we can actually exploit the fact that for a static scene that age should not change it's going to be the same age so we have a camera that keeps moving we have different camera motions for if, uh, mapping from the first image to the eyes image uh, but um, and the depth is constant. We assume that we have a moving camera and a static world. And so if you look at optical flow literature, this is exactly the color consistency term that you have in optical flow approaches. And these approaches tend to actually work in real time. If you have graphics cards, you can easily run them at 60 frames a second today. Um, here, the difference to optical flow is that we don't have a displacement field. Maybe I should mention, in optical flow, you have the same I0, and then you have, say, I1 of x plus an offset vector v dx. And so that is the flow vector that defines the correspondence, the offset in the image plane that matches to the next image and here you see we parameterize it very differently we have the rigid body motion in there that we assume known so we assume someone gives us in this case this PTAM we use the the camera motion from the PTAM software and H is the unknown depths the difference here is that this V is a two-dimensional depth map, so it assigns a two-dimensional vector to each pixel. H is a one-dimensional function. It's a scalar-valued function. So we're estimating much fewer parameters. And in that sense, the problem is much more constrained. There are only half as many unknowns if you want compared to optical flow plus we have more data terms if we take n images we have a lot of you know a lot of information and as you can see this is a, a um, what I call a direct approach uh, or what's called a direct approach in the sense that we directly use the colors of the image we don't do an abstraction, we don't extract feature points here, but directly compute a geometry, a depth map for the first image. 
And this term is a regularization term that's used a lot in, in uh, variational methods. It's called the total variation. This is the gradient, the derivative of that height function or depth map h. And it basically states that from one point to the next, the depth should not change too much. And now I was saying earlier, in white areas, we cannot expect the color consistency to tell us anything about the geometry. In other words, if everything is white, then this is going to be zero no matter what h is. So it's going to be valid for any h. And so this term will not give us any meaningful information about what is the right h. Right? So we are minimizing the overall cost with respect to h. If this is zero for any h, then that term is constant actually, it's independent of h. And so minimization of this term doesn't give us the right h. But then what we have here is what generates what we call this fill-in effect. We expect that we have some structure, some brightness variation in some locations of the image. That will tell us the geometry, the depths h. And in between we have a term that says neighboring pixels should have, if possible, similar depths. And so what that generates is very much like a soap film that interpolates between the reconstructed parts. So you have locations where the data term tells you what, age, what the right age is, and in between you just fill in with something like much like a soap film, actually. And in fact, you will see this effect of this term in the results. Wherever we have constant brightness areas, wherever we have no observations, we'll see this fill in. The way this is minimized, uh, we actually make use of strategies that we developed for optical flow estimation. I'm not going to go into detail here. We might look into that a little more in the, in, in the class on variational methods. Uh, here, I'll just say the way it's minimized is typically you linearize this term because this is nonlinear in H, so you can do Taylor expansions to linearize it. Then it only holds for small H this approximation and then what you do is a course to find linearization so you do this on the coarse scale where small h in the physical world actually corresponds to large uh, values and then you go from a coarse level to a finer level and this can all be implemented on graphics cards and it runs today at real time at frame rate and so these are some examples from the 2010 paper. This is one of several input images. I'll show you the sequence in a second. A camera moves around. This is the reconstruction that you get. Once you map the texture on top, this is what it looks like. So you get a fairly nice, dense representation of the geometry. And you get such a representation at frame rate, so very fast. Here's another example of a monitor sequence, and here you see the geometry, even if you zoom, is, is not so bad. But you already see this fill-in effect here, right? You see the structure, but in between there is a little bit that looks like the real world with the soap film superimposed. So there is a, a little bit of, of kind of blurring uh, across structures, and that is generated by this regular riser, by the total variation. Um, before I move to the next example, let me show you a video of this uh, method. So here is the input sequence. And you see how the, um, the camera moves just a little bit. It doesn't need a lot of motion, actually moves sideways a little bit back and forth. So this is using a, just a standard handheld camera, and this is the output uh, um, of the algorithm, uh, which, as I said, runs at pretty much frame rate. At the time, it wasn't in 2010, it wasn't exactly frame rate. It was running at 24 frames a second, but that was four years ago, and since then the graphics cards are much faster. 
and you see that in the beginning the reconstruction is not so good because we have not much image information but in the end it's fairly good here you see this the effects of the regular riser it fills in the uh, structures that were not visible so I didn't actually see any images from this side and so it kind of fills in with the soap film and this is the point uh, uh, where you can argue do you really want such a fill in if you don't know there is constant areas here where the fill in may be nice may be desirable but there are other areas where the fill in hallucinates geometry where you don't really know but then whether you want this kind of fill in or not depends on the application sometimes you absolutely need a dense geometry for example, you may need a dense geometry if you have a robot driving around and you want it to avoid obstacles. You need to know for any direction in space, is there an obstacle, is there geometry or not. And then if you just have a point cloud and you have points here and here, the question is, can I go in between or not? And then some, uh, some um, dense reconstruction is desirable. You can actually uh, tackle the same, uh, uh, the, you can use the same cost function. Here you see this color consistency cost function. But instead of estimating the geometry, as we did in the previous approach, you can try to estimate the camera motion. And this is nowadays often called dense tracking. Here, uh, uh, and so then you would have the unknown would not be H, but it would be the rigid body motion of the camera. As we know, you can parameterize it with some Xi in the, uh, uh, in the Lie algebra, little se3, so that's the six parameters of your rigid body motion. And then you can define that cost function directly with respect to that Xi, it's in here. And you can say minimize this color consistency measure as a function of the camera motion. That means find the camera motion from one image to the next such that if I map this color into 3D and rotate, translate according to the camera, the transformed camera, and then map back down, I should see the same image. For every pixel, the color that I see in the new image should be the same. And how do I get to it? Again, I map it to 3D HX, then I transform into the new camera coordinates with this unknown rigid body motion, and then I back project back down. And the colors should be the same. So we can use the exact same color consistency. Instead of estimating the geometry, we estimate the camera motion. And Similarly, we are not using feature points. We don't need feature points. We work directly with the input colors. So there is no intermediate step here. The issue is now we assume H is known and we estimate G. In a standard monocular setting, both are unknown. You don't know the geometry, you don't know the camera motion. In the previous approach, we assumed we knew the camera motion from this PTAM software. Here now, we assume we have the geometry. Let's say, for example, if we take an RGBD camera, that is a camera which gives you, like the Kinect camera, many, many of you will know it, is a camera that gives you color and the geometry H. So that is the depth map that the Kinect camera gives you. And once we have that, we can apply this approach to track a Kinect camera. And in fact, to my knowledge, uh, these types of approaches lead to what is currently the most accurate camera tracking for RGBD cameras. So we did this in 2010. We showed that you can track an RGBD camera in this way. Maybe a little more about how you solve this with respect to G, uh, sorry, Xi, the six degrees of freedom of your camera. The way you can do that is you can linearize the argument in here. So we have a quadratic penalizer, let's say, in this case, 
uh, we linearize the argument in here. So this is a Taylor expansion. How does that work? Here's the Xi. So we just have to do chain rule differentiation to get the first derivative. And so that is, if we did take, this is at the previous value, Xi zero, that's our expansion point of the Taylor expansion. And if we linearize around Xi zero, let's say that's our last estimate for the camera motion. And linearization means we have to take the derivative of this expression with respect to xi. First, that means we take the outer derivative of i with respect to its argument, that is nabla i2. Then we take the derivative of this interior argument with respect to g, so that is how does this change with respect to g. And then we have the change of g with respect to xi. So it's just, you know, derivatives is a standard technique and even if it's a complicated dependency you can always calculate derivatives assuming that things are differentiable but here everything is differentiable and so we can do by chain rule we can take a derivative and then we have the six parameters xi in here the six degrees of freedom What's the advantage of linearizing? Well once we linearize this holds for small xi um, so in the vicinity of xi zero, let's say, um, um, then this whole expression is quadratic in xi. And in fact, once you have a quadratic cost function like this, the one we have here, and you linearize the 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 the, the argument inside this norm, then what this leads to is something much like the Gauss-Newton algorithm. It actually is the same if you can derive the Gauss-Newton algorithm we talked about last time in quite the same manner. It basically means you can check for yourself that what you end up, if you square this, is you end up with a quadratic approximation where you drop the second order derivatives. So this is then a problem that is convex and quadratic. And so by construction, basically, it's a quadratic cost in Xi. And so the extremality condition is a linear equation system which we can solve. And it's an equation system in six parameters. So it's not even a whole lot to compute. It's actually, uh, this is a six by six matrix and it's some 6D vector. And so you just do a matrix inversion of a six by six matrix, nothing that is very difficult to do. And this is easily done even in real time on a standard CPU, no problem. And so, as I mentioned here, this linearization of the residuum in the, in the norm squared is equivalent to what's done in the Gauss-Newton approach, in this Gauss-Newton approximation to the Newton method, where we drop the Hessian. And this matrix A, indeed, you can check is by construction, actually, it's positive definite or positive semi-definite, so this is nicely solvable. Here is an example. This is the two color images, and then uh, the first and the second, and then we try to find a camera motion such that the two get perfectly aligned. And what you see down here is the second image registered to the first one. So we estimated the camera motion and then warped this image according to that camera motion to the first image, and you can basically see that uh, you get a fairly nice uh, image of that scene, apart from the edges where uh, structure that is visible here may no longer be visible there. If you have motions, you get self-occlusions, and in these areas of self-occlusions, this is going to not give a, the right color. In fact, you can then compute the difference of the second image warped to the first and the original first image, the difference between these two, and this is what it looks like. Where gray is actually zero, so basically it shows you where we have good color consistency. Almost everywhere except at the edges of objects, at the boundaries, because they get occluded once I keep moving the camera. Here's uh, uh, um, 
an evaluation where we can actually quantitatively evaluate how accurate is this approach and you see that in the small baseline setting so this is essentially corresponds to the baseline it's the frame difference but in some sense it, for a translational camera it means with more frames that we dropped so we match always the first image to the second to the fourth six eight etc and and the the larger the motion of the camera the more difficult this linearization is because it, it only works in the small baseline setting or it's designed for that and indeed in that setting it actually works better than the state of the art. The state of the art technique for geometric alignment or let's say a standard the most commonly used technique is a technique called iterated closest points. It's a fairly old approach that uh, has been cited, I don't know, 10,000 times by now. It's, a, it's an approach which aligns geometry, for example, laser scans, and it's used a lot for that purpose. The idea is that you iteratively find correspondence between points and then align with respect to that correspondence and then recompute point correspondences. Here, we don't actually need to do an iteration of correspondence finding, we just directly solve this alignment problem and get uh, better results, at least in the small baseline setting for which this is designed. Once we have larger camera motions, then we found that this ICP tends to work better. What I should mention though is that in the applications you are always in the small baseline setting. If you want to do real camera, real time camera tracking, then the camera from one frame to the next typically moves infinitesimally. So you're in that regime and this is where you want to get more accurate results. These techniques are not exactly new. There are some ideas that have been around before. For example, there is a related approach to tracking the camera by Comport, Malis and Rivas in 2007. And I believe this is one of the first approaches that does uh, direct tracking of the camera on SE3, on this uh, Lie algebra of rigid body motions. Then what you can do is you can improve that further. This was done by Carl Storm Kremers in 2013, so last year. We proposed an extension. What we do there is we drop the square here, right? You have a quadratic cost function, and that will be very sensitive to outliers. If you have some colors that don't match, it's going to create quite a substantial cost. If you want to be a little more robust, you will just drop the square, and then you will get robust estimation techniques. And then you will essentially this algorithm that you iterate here is then related to reweighted least squares estimation techniques. This is kind of a least squares problem once you linear once you linearize in here, right? Then we have a least squares problem. And um, um, once you drop the square you can formalize it as a reweighted least squares problem. I'll show you an example from the 2011 paper. Here you see the scene that we observe with an RGBD camera. We move around the table here. And this is actually the scene observed uh, from the camera, but we put it into a third-person perspective. So we can determine where is that camera at any given time, and we can basically rotate and translate the entire scene according to that motion, such that although everything was filmed from this moving camera, it appears to the viewer as if he's standing outside that scene. And you can imagine what this is good for, um, basically what you can do here is you can then fuse these different geometric scans to a coherent 3D model. Because once you have the camera, then you can basically put all the, the measures of geometry that the RGBD camera gives you, you can put them all into the same world coordinate system, and that way you can reconstruct uh, rooms and buildings. I forgot actually to pull up an example, but let me find one. Um, 
So these are the camera tracks that you can uh, generate in this way. Here is a representation of that world in a voxel grid, in an adaptive voxel grid uh, that uses an octree representation to represent the, the world. And here you see the entire scene reconstructed as one 3D model with colors superimposed. And we found this technique is actually quite accurate. You see there are holes, so this is an approach that does not do any geometric fill-in. There is no regularization. And so whatever uh, structures were not measured with your R RGBD sensor where you didn't get depth values, you'll have holes. It just leaves that open. But what you can see is we can actually recover very large scenes. This is like all our offices uh, uh, reconstructed from a handheld RGBD camera. And so you have, I don't know, some 10 rooms there. And you can zoom into every office and you get geometry and color at a very high level of detail. Again, there are missing parts, especially like windows. You don't get any depth measurements if you look out the window. But overall, the uh, level of accuracy is fairly good, so you can zoom in and even read what's written on the books, etc. So I, f I was actually quite surprised at what level of detail we can recover, despite having like a whole corridor of offices in here. So this is what RGBD tracking is good for once you have the camera. This is kind of the key challenge. And you can imagine you need a, a very accurate location of the camera at every time. Uh, you can then evaluate how accurate the camera tracking is. For example, this is a benchmark that we developed together with uh, several students uh, and former postdocs, so uh, in particular Jürgen and, uh, and Nicolas Engelhardt were with us until very recently. And they set up this, this is Nicolas uh, here, setting up an RGBD, uh, 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 no, uh, a motion capture system here, and then you have marker points on your Kinect camera or RGBD camera that allows you to track accurately where is the camera, so we have a ground truth here. And then we can use the RGBD images to, to compute our camera motion and check how accurate is this with respect to the true motion. Provided, of course, that the motion capture system it has an error that is substantially smaller than your estimates. And then you can put it even on a, on a driving robot and acquire images from a moving robot for these kinds of scenarios. And, and so in this uh, benchmark we devised, there are different uh, data sets, some are very simple, so more translational motions, and some have more complex, also rotational motions. Some even involve larger office spaces, so you can, whatever algorithm people develop, they can check on the data sets that are suitable for their algorithm. They can check how accurate are their methods. Um, <coughs> In the previous approach for camera tracking, we basically said the, the color images should be consistent. Once you have an RGBD camera, each camera also gives you a depth image. And so you can ask how, how consistent are the depth images. And so you can similarly try to align, you can have a cost function that combines color consistency and geometric consistency. Right, so if I move the camera around, then not only should these colors be the same, but the depth values should be consistent. And so you, you can have a residuum in color for image I, that would be RCI, and you re have a residuum with respect to the depths, where the residuum is always the consistency. And then you can have a cost function that combines the two residuals. So this is a quadratic cost function in the two residuals with a matrix sigma that, uh, um, that you have here. And that is assuming that this residuum follows a bivariate uh, uh, t-distribution, the so-called student t-distribution. This is a generalization of a Gaussian distribution, which is a little more flexible, and it has an additional parameter in here, new. Uh, 
And you can check actually if, uh, it generalizes the Gaussian. For example, if you take new equals infinity, very large, then basically this is constant one and then you have a Gaussian distribution here, then you have no weight. And for nu equals zero, you get, uh, you get one over this term, and so you essentially get a constant here. So it kind of interpolates, loosely speaking, between a Gaussian distribution and a uniform distribution. So this is the generalization called the t-distribution. This is more than 100 years old. It's used a lot in statistics. Um, and so you can use that assumption to assume that uh, it to in what way the color, uh, the color consistency uh, and the geometric consistencies vary, and then you get this, it's again a least squares problem, and, and a nonlinear weighted least squares problem, and so you can apply Gauss-Newton style algorithms uh, and re-estimate these weights and the sigma along to solve it, and what you get is more accuracy. Um, <coughs> yeah, I, I'll not show examples, but we found that this, to our knowledge, is the currently most accurate algorithm to track uh, a Kinect camera. Another thing that uh, you need to do when you do large-scale reconstruction, this is something that I haven't mentioned in class yet, but this is used frequently for large-scale reconstruction, it's called the loop closure. The idea is that we track the camera from one frame to the next, and we estimate this camera motion, rotation and translation from one frame to the next. Now, if you assume you walk around with a camera and get hundreds and hundreds of frames, and every time you estimate the camera motion from one frame to the next, even if your tracker is very accurate, you're always going to make a little mistake. And over time, with hundreds and hundreds of estimates, that error will accumulate. And so, once you move around the scene in a circle or some circular motion, once you come back to the original point, you will have a substantial error, depending on how long that loop is. But if it's a loop involving thousands of images, you can expect you'll have a substantial error. The question is, what can you do? One strategy is what we talked about, is the bundle adjustment. You set that one cost function, you try to estimate all camera motions in one globally consistent approach. An alternative that is somewhat more slim and faster to solve is a technique used in robotics a lot, in lasers, uh, typically laser-based reconstructions. And uh, um, this technique is called loop closuring. Uh, the idea is that you estimate the camera motion from frame i to frame j, let's call this xi i j hat, that is the local estimate of that camera motion. And so we get lots of local estimates between not only consecutive cameras, but maybe even more distant cameras in a certain vicinity. I'll show you a video in a second that shows that. And so you estimate these camera motions, and then you try to find a trajectory, meaning camera motion uh, locations or rotation translation associated with each camera, such that they are consistent with all of these measurements. So you first measure lots of pairwise camera motions, and then you find a camera motion xi i such that if xi i uh, concatenated with xi j inverse should be the same as the motion from i to j. So I have a motion from world coordinates to camera i, I have a motion from world coordinates to camera j, the motion between i and j should be xi i, xi j inverse. And uh, ideally, that term should be zero, and so you penalize a least squares kind of problem. But again, one should keep in mind, this is not a linear least squares problem, because we're optimizing for xi, and they are in here in this concatenation, and there is an inverse, so it's a little bit involved. But this is the term that you minimize here. Um, and this sigma ij, you can introduce the uncertainty of the measurement ij. 
So you can downweight terms where the measurement is not very certain. So once you have an estimate of the camera motion and an estimate of how certain is that camera motion, you can uh, put that in here and then you have a weighted least squares problem. I believe this should be sigma inverse, actually. So if sigma denotes the uncertainty, then for larger uncertainty, we want a smaller weight. And so we would have sigma inverse here. And then you can solve this nonlinear least squares problem, for example, again, using a levenberg marquardt algorithm. Here you see an example. This is the camera trajectory. And what you see here is if you just use the local tracking, that is the red curve, and you see there is a certain error here. And the longer you move, the larger the error gets. And once you introduce loop closure, that means you find pairwise uh, matches between the uh, images and so uh, um, corresponding camera motions and then you optimize this least squares problem that I showed you then you get the pink curve the optimized trajectory that is in pink and you see it follows much better the ground truth trajectory that we have in green they're almost identical in most locations here again there is a video uh, to show this uh, Sorry, I'm on the wrong. Here is the scene. Here is uh, subsequent cameras. The red camera is always the current camera, the moving camera. And so what I have to do to make this work, I have to store so-called uh, keyframes, that is, uh, certain cameras. I'm not going to store all of them to remain somewhat efficient, but w some keyframes, and then these green curves, basically these green lines, they are uh, links that relate this camera to some previous cameras in a certain neighborhood. And you can see that while the camera moves, we create links to existing keyframes, and then we optimize this. And this can be done in real time. It's very fast to minimize. And so you can kind of assure global consistency of the camera trajectory while you move around. And as you saw in the video, the camera trajectory, so you're not only correcting the current camera, but on the fly you're correcting all previous cameras. And, and, and so it's, it's actually a very simple graph optimization problem where each camera corresponds to the node of a graph. And once we have a correspondence between cameras, that's links uh, or edges in this graph. Uh, and then you do a graph optimization to get a consistent. And you see how the whole trajectory distorts a little bit every now and then. Yes, I think we'll stop here and then we'll continue next time. Thank you. Okay, welcome to class. This is the next part on multiple view geometry. And today we'll continue in the chapter on direct methods. So these are methods that try to directly reconstruct the geometry from the image data. And the key idea was that we try to avoid this intermediate step of computing feature points, extracting feature points, and then working on these point clouds only. But actually try to estimate the desired parameters, the desired reconstruction, the motion of the camera, all that we want to compute directly from the data. This is a common trend in many areas of data analysis that you have to ask yourself, is there a way to directly get from the original data to uh, the parameters or the model parameters that you try to estimate, or do you have to do intermediate steps of abstraction levels? And, as, uh, and there's always a trade-off. Typically, the trade-off is that, you, uh, that when you work with direct methods, uh, you need more memory, more computation time, because the original data that you have is usually very high-dimensional.
something we mentioned in the very beginning of the class. This is why often we tend to abstract to a sparse set of feature points to work with, hoping that th this abstracted set of points c carries sufficient information to compute what we need. But once you delve deeper into the matter, you often see that if you use more data, ideally all the data that you have, then you will typically get more robustness um, and you will somehow get more accurate solutions, ideally, because you're really exploiting all information and not just a, s a subset of the information. But there is a trade-off, and I believe one of the reasons why these direct techniques have become more popular in the recent years is that today we have more computational power, and today we have more memory to compute these kinds of things. One of the approaches I mentioned, a direct approach to tracking a camera, is an approach, uh, this is one work by Carol and co-workers, where we estimate the motion of an RGBD camera, like a Kinect camera, directly from the original data. And in this setting, I mentioned that one of the aspects you want to do, in particular for long-term tracking of cameras, if you have hundreds of frames to track, uh, then you want to do loop closuring. That is to say, you want to assure a globally consistent reconstruction. Of course, in bundle adjustment, we also aim for a globally consistent reconstruction. The loop closure is actually a somewhat simplified variant, if you will, of, of bundle adjustment, where you only estimate the camera motions and you try to find a consistent camera trajectory. So assume we have estimated camera motions from frame I to frame J, not just for adjacent frames, but maybe even by matching larger baseline frames, say the first, the fourth, and the first to the fifth frame, then we have lots of pairwise matchings. And now we try to find a trajectory that is a rigid body motion for each time step i from 1 to large t, in a way that these are consistent with the pairwise estimates. So we have a pairwise, uh, so we have estimated, as you can see with these drawings here, each line indicates that we have an estimate here of what the pose transformation between these two cameras should be. And we have an estimate what the pose transformation between these should be, between these, and so we have a graph structure where each edge, each node in the graph represents one keyframe and each edge represents a pairwise correspondence and an alignment of keyframes, a rigid body motion that uh, we would like to get between these two frames. And then one can run an optimization uh, approach. This is uh, a cost function like this one. It's a non-linear least squares type of cost function quadratic, but it's not, each argument is obviously not linear in, in Xi, but there's a concatenation here, and then we can try to optimize this. By the way, something I did not mention, there is some little details hidden here. What you see here is a rigid body motion, another rigid body motion, and these are the six parameters, the six dimensional vector in the Lie algebra, and then we concatenate these. I didn't actually say how this concatenation is defined. So this concatenation is an operator. In this case, it's rigid body motion. So we have little se3 and little se3. These are the two poses. And what comes out is another uh, um, uh, element in the Lie algebra. And the way it's defined is if we have a pose and concatenate it with a, another pose, it's defined as we take the rigid body transformation associated with the first pose, that is x to the xi hat. Remember, x maps the, um, the Lie algebra coordinate to a Lie group, so a rigid body motion. And then we multiply that with the rigid body motion from the other one. And then to get a Lie algebra element, again, we take the log of this, so we invert. So we basically, if you want to see it graphically, here's our Lie algebra large SE3, uh, sorry, Lie group. Here's the Lie algebra, the tangent space little SE3. We go uh, from the Lie algebra to the Lie group with the exponential map, and then we just 
uh, concatenate the group elements, the rigid body transformations are multiplied. These are matrices. They're multiplied with each other. So these are in particular matrices of the form RT01, right? And these we can just multiply to model the concatenation. And once we have concatenated them, we go back to the Lie algebra with the logarithm. And so this is basically the definition of this concatenation operator that we have in here. So it's a little bit tricky, you know, the formula looks fairly simple, but what's hidden behind it is a little bit more complicated, but not, not too bad. Overall, this is then a nonlinear least squares problem, not just because you have uh, xi and xi inverse here, but also because the concatenation operator involves logarithm and exponential. In the end, it's definitely not a linear transformation, so it's a nonlinear least squares problem. And so we can solve it, for example, using the Levenberg Marquardt, this Gauss Newton variant uh, that um, iteratively minimizes these cost functions. We're not going to find a provably optimal solution here because this is not a convex problem, but uh, typically this works fairly well. In particular, as I mentioned, if this uh, operation is not too far from linear, then these iterative algorithms tend to work quite well. <coughs> So this way we can solve the pose estimation and we can assure, as shown here, that we get a globally consistent <coughs> camera trajectory. Globally consistent in the sense that we have one trajectory that is consistent as consistent as possible with all of these measurements. Right? So once I go from a camera J to camera I, I should ma I should be consistent with what I measured there. And this sigma ij, sorry, it should be sigma inverse, I've, I haven't updated this yet, this uh, it takes into account the uncertainty. How reliable was that measurement? And this we can compute as well. For example, if we find a pose transformation that matches the image, it should give good color consistency. If the color consistency, the best one we find, is not good, then we might want to downweight the corresponding term in the sum. And so here you see a comparison. <coughs> the red curve is what we call the rough odometry. This is just the Xi ij hat. So this is the original edge symmet from frame to frame. And with time, it tends to deviate a little bit, such that in the end, you have quite a discrepancy regarding where you are in the world and which direction your camera is facing. But once you do loop closure, that's the pink curve. This is then the optimized trajectory, meaning the trajectory after minimizing this cost function. We get this pink curve. And as you can see, the pink curve is actually quite consistent with the ground truth. And so in the end, we are quite close to where we should be according to the true trajectory. I think there's a video as well. I don't know if I showed that last time. Here's the video that kind of shows this process of um, iteratively updating. So this is running. There's always a, 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 a global Levenberg Marquardt type algorithm. It runs, it's very fast. And so you can run it in real time, meaning you can run it at around 30 frames a second. You can make sure that all the cameras are consistent. But you can imagine there is one issue here, and that is if you take more and more cameras, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of frames, already we make it efficient by not taking every camera, but only every now and then we keep a key frame and make sure these are consistent. If you were to take every single camera and you would have thousands of cameras, then even this iterative live and back mark what is going to be slower and slower because we'll have more and more terms in the sum to take into account. And so this is an issue to f devise strategies which can do loop closing for a camera that you use to walk around and in a way that ideally the runtime does not depend on how long you've been walking. 
right? Because you don't want, and this is a, a tricky challenge, to figure out strategies that scale well with the number of cameras, that don't go slower and slower. Because even if you only take every fifth frame a keyframe, if you keep walking still, the process is going to get slower and slower the longer you walk. And so there are strategies to, to kind of improve on that. But what we get is a fairly consistent 3D model of the environment. And one of the things you can do with it, I think I showed it last time, is you can reconstruct rooms, you can reconstruct people, etc. Yes? Are keyframes anything special, or do you take every That's a good question. So uh, I mentioned the keyframes, and that you don't take all frames, but only every now and then. So there are actually many heuristics about selecting good keyframes. I'm not going to go into detail here. There's lots of ideas. So for example, if you stay still in one place and you get more and more images but they're all the same, then taking every fifth frame is a very naive strategy, of course, because you would get a lot of redundant frames. And so one way is to take only every fifth frame as some criterion to prune out. Another criterion might be if the camera motion is sufficiently different from the previous one. So the camera has moved a sufficient amount, then you take another keyframe. Because you can estimate for the current camera, always estimate what is the post transform to the previous one. And once the, p the, the camera has transformed sufficiently in terms of translation or rotation, you can take another keyframe. But typically these are all heuristics. And then there are strategies to, you know, to, to consider entropy as a concept of selecting keyframes. So there are many, many strategies to, to, to do that. In the end, though, uh, the key is to not work with all cameras in order to keep things efficient. Another trick is, for example, you could use only keyframes where you have a very good match to the previous frames. So you keep computing the camera, the current camera motion, using the correspondence to previous frames. If you don't find a good alignment of images, then maybe you should not select that frame as a keyframe because it's not well aligned anyway. So this would be a, a third, say, criterion for keyframe selection. And typically, in practice, what you use is a mix of different strategies uh, to select keyframes. Which strategy, then, is the best one is usually shown by experimental validation. And so you try different strategies and see what that gives you. Unfortunately, I think this is a domain where there is no provably optimal keyframe selection strategy. So what I talked about in the past uh, a couple of slides was approaches that directly go from the images to either estimating the camera motion, as we saw last time, or in the previous work of dense RGB, uh, uh, real-time dense geometry that try to estimate dense geometry from images. One of the first papers I know of that actually combined the two is a work of Newcomb, Lovegrove and Davison in ICCV 2011. It's called Dense Tracking and Mapping, sometimes abbreviated as DTAM, uh, as an acronym. And this is a strategy which tries to jointly estimate the geometry of the scene densely and the motion of the camera in a direct way. So directly from the images. And in many ways it is, of course, uh, as always in research, similar to previous approaches. Here is the cost function they use. They actually have two cost functions. One that they optimize to get the geometry and another one that they use to estimate the camera motion <coughs> for the given geometry. And then they alternate. So this is actually quite a challenging chicken and egg problem because they need the geometry to estimate the motion of the camera. Like in the previous approach, we used the depth map, so we assumed we have the geometry. Th these authors actually compute the geometry from a standard color camera or gray value camera. <coughs> and so this is the approach to estimate the geometry. And if you look back to this 
uh, real-time dense geometry of Jan Stümer and co-workers, this approach is actually quite similar. In fact, these two approaches were developed in, in parallel in many ways. <coughs> And so the data term, as you can see, tries to align the images given the camera motion. So you assume you have the camera motion. The key difference, though, of, of what Newcomb and co-workers do compared to Stuymer and co-workers, uh, the 2010 paper that I mentioned earlier, in this paper they use the inverse dips. So they don't parameterize the geometry as a function of dips that we did. We call it H, the dips. Here they work in inverse dips. Now you would say, where's the difference? For the data term, there is actually no difference. It's the same data term. Because whether I multiply X with H or divide it by one or... Uh, or mu uh, uh, if whether I div um, uh, divide it by the inverse depths or multiply it by the depths is of course the same. The difference is though that the regular riser is the total uh, weighted form of the total variation, not on the depths but on the inverse depths. And it turns out that that is actually a smarter representation of the problem. Because one of the things you have in this uh, depth map estimation, and this is something I must admit I did not realize at the time when we worked on it, is that uh, you have a bias in the sense that structures that are very far away that have a large depth correspond to very small pixels, very few pixels only, whereas structures that are nearby the same area of surface corresponds to many, many pixels. And once you use the inverse depths, and regularize not the depths but the inverse depths that alleviates this bias a little bit. If you use the depths, you get a, a different smoothing effect in the background and in the foreground. And you don't want that. You want surface smoothing to be s the same in foreground and background. And here you have, you have removed that dependency. And so this is assuming fixed camera motion. Another thing that they do is, uh, is a common strategy, actually. You can couple the geometric smoothness term to the brightness, the color variation in the image. Typically, you would expect, let's say, if you look at me, I have a different color from the brighter background, and you would expect uh, discontinuities in the depth map to be in locations where you also have color discontinuities. So where the color changes, say, from dark to bright, typically you can expect there may also be a depth change. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. And if that tends to happen in the world you live in, so if, if the world is typically made of, of, of different colored objects that have different depths, meaning discontinuities in the depths tend to coincide with discontinuities in color, then you can bring that in here and you can have a weighting and a space-dependent weighting row which basically, once there is a strong ga gradient, a strong color change, it's down-weighted. Meaning then a jump in U, a, a discontinuity in U, doesn't cost as much. It's cheaper. So in this approach, once you have a strong gradient, nabla I is large, you have a strong color change in a certain location X, then E to the minus gradient gets small. Then you have a small weight in here, meaning then you can change very quickly in space and it's not going to cost too much. And so th this is what you would call an adaptive regularizer, an, a, a, a color adaptive smoothness term for the geometry. Mind you, it's not always like that. So this assumption that depth discontinuities tend to coincide with color discontinuities is not always true. If you take a zebra, for example, right, you have a clear, bright and dark pattern, you have very strong gradients, and then you would reduce the geometric smoothness on the zebra area because you have a lot of color changes there. Whether that's really what you want is, is a question. And so, on average, we also observe that this weighting can improve things, but not necessarily. <laughs> the other thing is you have parameters here uh, that that can uh, sigma and alpha that sigma is is a, is a spatial smoothing so you can say I'll only 
downweight the weight if the gradient happens on a certain spatial scale uh, and then alpha is it tells you how fast with the change in gradient how fast this weight should go down and these parameters you have to kind of tune them in practice to get good performance And then, <coughs> so this is the way that uh, Newcomb and co-workers estimate a dense geometry in terms of an inverse depth, which is regularized here. And then they also estimate the camera motion, uh, so they estimate both in alternation. And the camera motion, the camera tracking is done quite similar to what I mentioned in the Steinberger paper, which appeared uh, simultaneously. So they also have a cost function and try to find a transformation that aligns the color images for the given geometry. And then they need to alternate and one of the challenges in this alternating scheme is that you have to find a good initialization. What do you do if you don't have any camera motion, if you don't have any geometry? And so typically there is some initialization strategy to find an initial estimate for the camera motion. Here is an example, and here you see the PTAM points. They compare their approach to PTAM. These points are the track points of PTAM. So much like in, in, in Jan Stümer's work that actually uses PTAM, they don't use PTAM, uh, I think at some point maybe for initialization purposes, but they definitely compare to PTAM, and here is the dense reconstruction they obtain. And there is also a video... <coughs> Uh, that Richard put on, on the internet. And so here you see uh, this, sorry, uh, this approach. Here's the, the uh, texture map model and here's the inverse depth. So they keep moving a camera around and while they move, the, the, the geometry emerges. Here's just the depth map and here's the depth map with color superimposed. And then what you can do, and Richard really played around a lot with this, this is an augmented reality application where he inserted an object into the scene and he compared to PTAM. If you use PTAM to do that and if you shake the camera around and if you get a lot of blurring, then PTAM will not find reliable feature points and will get lost. And so you can see the PTAM approach will at some point lose the, ca the location of the car. Here is again the PTAM, uh, and here the, he explicitly does defocus, which of course is nasty because a feature point approach is going to break down instantly. It doesn't find any more features, whereas a dense approach which uh, aims at finding color consistency is not so sensitive to be things being in focus. And so here he shows that the reconstructions are actually uh, fairly accurate. And he shows that it's robust to changes in lighting, etc. And so you can demonstrate a lot of effects. There is a little bit of over-smoothing. This comes through this regularization term that I mentioned earlier already, that it, it's a little bit like a soap film that is superimposed on, on the geometry of the world. And then here's another scene. And then he, this is uh, real time. You can see with the with the cursor uh, buttons, he can move the car around and drive around in the scene while it's filming. And so, as you can see, it actually uses a little bit of the geometry of the world uh, for steering the camera. You can imagine this is quite entertaining for augmented reality purposes. You can do a lot of funny things with it. And one of the keys in augmented reality is here you see again an example where he drives over this ramp. <coughs> one of the key challenges in augmented reality that's shown quite nicely in this work uh, is you need the real-time performance to have a, a good augmented reality um, if you want to do some interactive stuff. <coughs> 
And so this, as I said, is one of the first works that directly estimates both the geometry and the color of the world. A somewhat different approach that is also real-time capable, but in contrast to the previous approaches, it actually works in real-time on a CPU. It's, uh, it doesn't need a GPU. The key challenge, actually, to mention these variational methods that you solve, we'll talk a little more in later chapters about variational methods that, so that you get a better understanding of what these expressions actually mean, how they are solved. But one of the difficulties here is uh, this is a very large-scale optimization problem because for every pixel in the image, you compute a depth. And you have a regularity term that couples the estimation of one depth to that of the neighboring depths. To solve these problems efficiently has been possible only in very recent years and, uh, and only actually through partially through graphics cards because we can run the optimization of these problems on GPUs. And actually, uh, I mentioned that we were inspired by, by this optical flow stuff. In fact, Newcomb, Lovegrove and Davison also started out with our optical flow techniques because they ran in real time on the GPU. Uh, and so they started with that to solve these problems in real time. But you need the GPU today to get this solved efficiently, whereas if you don't do regularization, you can actually get much faster solutions uh, for a large-scale optimization that run on the CPU. And one of these I will show you uh, in the next few slides. This is an approach uh, which we just coined LSD SLAM for large-scale direct monocular SLAM. Uh, there are two papers. One of them came out last December at the ICCV, and the other one will uh, be presented at ECCV in October of this year, in Zurich, actually. Um, this approach combines several innovations, several contributions, which actually makes it very well suited for a large-scale monocular SLAM, so a standard color or gray value camera uh, and there's a number of differences compared to other approaches. First of all, it's a direct approach so it does not abstract to feature points. It actually directly computes what we call a semi-dense depth map. So this is not dense compared to the previous approach but only semi-dense. In practice typically about every second pixel will have a depth value associated. Now you might ask which pixels are going to have a depth value and which are not. Well, it's actually quite easy. Any pixel that has any kind of gray value variation, a gradient, will have a depth value associated. And any pixel where there's really no gray value variation in that area will not get a depth value. And that is because for pixels in a constant brightness area, you cannot determine depths. It's just not possible. Assume you have a completely white wall that you observe with maybe even several images from a standard color camera. How will you ever estimate the geometry of that wall? If it's all white, all you will see is white. Now you could assume, I'll assume it's flat, but how do you know? Of course, the world we live in, walls tend to be flat, so that assumption may work for a particular wall. It may work on average, but it's a hallucination. You don't actually observe that. You bring that knowledge in f uh, as a prior, so to say. And what Jacob set out to do is he said, I want to do large-scale slam from a handheld color camera, but I don't want to hallucinate information that I cannot observe. And so he said, we'll only work with those pixels that have sufficient gray value variation. This is somewhat related to this feature point approaches that extract corners in location where you have uh, gray value variation. The difference, though, is that this approach also includes points that lie on an edge, for example. If you have an edge, these points, there is gray value variation. 
Of course, you will not be able to directly estimate the geomet the, the depths of this point itself solely, but you it gives you some information. There is some information if the camera moves this way, then you can actually see the motion in a certain direction. And so all of these points will be taken into account in this semi-dense depth map. Another thing Jacob set out to do is he introduced an uncertainty. So he not only estimates the depths for all these pixels, but he estimates a cer an uncertainty. And then once you have estimates and uncertainties, you can fuse these estimates with later estimates using strategies much like a Kalman filter. Maybe, if you, maybe some of you have heard of Kalman filters. The idea is to combine measurements, and you can combine them statistically in a meaningful way once you have associated uncertainties. And so he estimates the dips, and he propagates and estimates over time the uncertainty of that dips. And he can actually prune out, for example, he can show you a more dense reconstruction, and then he can prune out those points that are more certain uh, over those that are not as certain. And then you get a sparser and sparser reconstruction, but the points that remain are the ones where you're really sure where they are. The other thing he does is when you do monocular SLAM, we talked about this before, you don't actually, you cannot estimate the scale of things. Because from color images, everything is only defined up to scale. And to allow for uh, strong changes in scale in the estimation to allow for a setting where you can zoom in with the camera, go very close to objects, and at the same time very far away, he uh, actually extends uh, the representation of the camera motion, which we used SE3, by a Lie group called SIM3, which includes, in addition to rotation and translation, it allows for scaling of the world. And so whether you scale the camera motion or scale the geometry, that's of course a kind of a equivalent. And so he uses an additional parameter to kind of allow the scale to, to vary for each camera. And then it uses global consistency in the, in the sense of loop closure that we talked about before. For example, to, to relate that, the DTAM in the previous slide does not do loop closure. And so it works quite well in the settings you saw. You can reconstruct even densely a desk scene, but if you want to reconstruct an entire building or a city or several buildings, this will no longer work. Then you need to impose global consistency. If you just track from frame to frame over hundreds of frames around a building, then the errors accumulate and it's, it's just not going to work. And so this is why here we actually introduce the loop closuring again on SIM3. And so <coughs> this tracking is done in a direct way and as well on SIM3, so compared to the approaches I mentioned in the previous slides which use SE3 for tracking, here we have another scale parameter, little s, that is some non-negative scale parameter that allows to scale kind of the world. There are different representations of SIM3 elements. This is a standard way to represent it. An alternative is if you divide this by S, then you get elements of the form R, and then you have, say, a T tilde, which is T divided by S, and then 1 over S here. So this would be another way to write it. So in other words, you can also rescale the 1 down here. It doesn't really matter where you put the additional parameter, the key is that you have some additional parameter in here, little s. And this is, of course, again, a Lie group. It's a group, you can check. Uh, uh, there are group elements, there are inverse elements, etc. It's closed with respect to group concatenation multiplication. And it's a Lie group in the sense that you can infinitesimally move from one group element to another. And so there is an associated Lie algebra, which is denoted by little sim3. And this is in contrast to SE3, it's a not six, but seven dimensional uh, group. The seventh dimension is related to that scale factor. 
<coughs> and then you can solve much like we discussed before, some nonlinear least squares problem where you have residua associated with, with these poses uh, here, uh, rigid body motion and scaling, so elements in SIM3, and you find the transformation that minimizes this residuum to track your camera. And the residua, I'm not going to go into detail here, but they're quite similar to what Carol and co-workers introduced in 2013. So there is a color residuum, and, and you can have a depth residuum as well. Um, and then you use uh, a weighted Gauss-Newton algorithm on the Lie group SIM3 to minimize this. And this is quite along the lines of what I discussed in the work of Carroll, where you have this non-linear least squares problem. And here, in fact, these are the, I actually wrote down from the paper, these are the update steps. So you might remember you have the pose update, the pose at time t plus 1 is the one at time t, and then you concatenate this with a, a, a pose update delta, Xi and delta Xi is this is the classical Gauss-Newton update. This is in fact uh, the approximation to the Hessian JJ transpose. Once you have a weighting, the weighting is in here, and so it's the inverse Hessian times the gradient. This Newton step basically, uh, but with the approximation of the Gauss-Newton. And J is uh, is then the 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 gradient of the residuum, so the Jacobian of the residuum. Um, but again, you have to keep in mind that these concatenation steps are defined as I showed here, in this way. So this is a concatenation on the Li, on the, that's actually concatenating the corresponding Li group elements in SIM3. <coughs> What you can get with this is shown here. These are input images where Jacob walked around, uh, I think this is actually on campus somewhere, and here you see these uh, semi-dense depth maps. The color code encodes the depths, so red means it's nearby, green means it's in the mid-plane, and blue means it's far away. And you see it's semi-dense, and indeed anywhere where you have some gray value variation, so not on the floor, typically not in the sky either, but anywhere else you get a depth estimate. And then there is a globally consistent reconstruction that's computed, and this is the camera trajectory, and it involves things like loop closuring. In fact, this approach, in some sense, uh, has two geometric representations. One is uh, a keyframe-based representation, where for keyframes we estimate these semi-dense depth maps. Uh, and another representation is a 3D world coordinate representation, where all these estimated depth values with their uncertainties are fused in a coherent world map. The nice thing about this approach is it allows to do the loop closuring on the fly. So everything, including the loop closure and the world reconstruction, are done in real time on a standard CPU. Here's a demo where you see the approach in action. <coughs> what you see here, maybe I'll stop the demo for a second, is uh, many things. The camera is moving around somewhere outside the, the image area right now. Uh, here you see the live video shown in this in inset in here. This is the semi-dense depth map for the current keyframe that's being that uh, is computed, and this is the world rec uh, reference frame reconstruction that is emerging in the background. And sometimes we change the viewpoint to give you a better sense of of this reconstruction. Here you see the handheld camera. Uh, and here you see the reconstruction as we've computed it so far. And so this is an approach that on a laptop CPU can give you in real time the world in front of the camera. At least a semi-dense world. It's not dense, we 
have discussed it for a while, uh, whether we should make it dense or not, we decided for now to keep it semi-dense. We could make it dense by basically regularizing this, filling in the missing information, but as I said, this would hallucinate geometry in the missing areas. Here you see applications to outdoor, here you see the scale, you can get very close to an object, you can get very far away, uh, and you will get a consistent reconstruction over multiple scales, basically. Typically, this is a challenge for real-time reconstruction algorithms. They often are designed for some particular spatial scale. Here, since we work on SIM3, we, uh, we get a very nice robustness to strong scale variations where you can go very close, see fine scale details, but still go very far and see the whole the whole structure. And again here you see the semi-dense depth maps. About, I would say, 50% of pixels have a meaningful depth value, and for the rest we don't, we don't say. We leave that open. Here you see another example of a very long uh, uh, trajectory where we, uh, this is actually speeded up by a factor of eight. You see that the images are really handheld, so he shakes around a lot. The approach is quite robust to all of these perturbations. And now you will see, I'll stop the video here. Now at this point, you will see he does a loop closure. He realizes, the algorithm realizes, that this is actually the same area as here. And so the challenge in large-scale loop closuring is to, to have an efficient strategy to relocalize yourself with respect to what you've already seen, to determine, oh, this place I have seen before. And once you have, you try to align this place to the previous place with this SIM3 alignment. And if there's a consistency that you get above a certain score, let's say, then you can impose that loop closuring and get a consistent. And that the effect is, as you saw here, it realigns the structures. And in the end, you get a very consistent reconstruction of this entire area here. Yes, so here are more examples, kind of zoom-ins that show this scale variation that you have a large structure and in some part of the structure you can zoom in here, you can zoom in there and you get a lot of very fine scale details despite having a very large area reconstructed. As I said, you know, filling in might be a, uh, the next step to do uh, to get a dense reconstruction, and in fact, we are working on that challenge right now. Um, the question is, can we still retain the real-time performance once we do filling in of geometry? We may need to use a GPU, so it's not going to be real-time on a CPU, most likely, but possibly with the GPU, we might get a dense uh, reconstruction in real time. The other issue is maybe semi-dense for certain applications is sufficient. For example, if you move around with a robot, possibly to do obstacle avoidance, to do recognition of structures, a semi-dense reconstruction may be sufficient for certain applications. And so there is a trade-off. For example, one of the things that we are planning to do as well is fly quadrocopters, helicopters autonomously using this strategy because it's a very nice way not only to reconstruct the world, but also to precisely estimate where am I in the world. And since it runs on a GPU, it actually, uh, on a CPU, it actually runs on smartphones as well. We have a paper coming out later this year where we show you can do augmented reality on a smartphone. So you don't need the laptop, you can run this all, all on a smartphone. Not exactly at the same frame rate, not exactly including all the aspects like loop closuring, etc., but at least uh, uh, in a way that you get very nice augmented reality. So we can reproduce a lot of the experiments that I showed that uh, Richard Newcomb did, except we can run it on a, on a, uh, on a smartphone. And, of course, the advantage of being independent of a GPU is that you can run 
your algorithms on portable devices, on smartphones, but also on quadrocopters. Right now, at least the smaller quadrocopters cannot carry a GPU. Plus, the GPU consumes a lot of energy, and so in practice, if you can do things on a CPU for these kind of embedded systems, it's actually an advantage. Okay, that concludes this chapter.